Christ is our firm foundation. The rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad. I put my faith in Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. I still got joy in chaos. Got peace that makes no sense. I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength. Cause I build my life on Jesus. I build on you. He is dead.
won't He won't, no, he won't He won't fail He won't fail He won't No, he won't Be 
Because you live, we can face tomorrow. Lord, this morning we're asking, Lord, we invite you, Lord God, and we invite people that don't know who you are, Lord God, to meet, to meet you, Lord God, this morning. Jesus, this morning we invite your people to come and visit, to come in and, and experience the Holy Spirit and Jesus like they never have before, Lord God. And so this morning, we worship you for all that you are. Thank goodness you are. Praise the Lord that you are alive today. Lord, and as we as we give you our attention, as we, as we focus in on you, Lord God, this morning. Once again, we, we ask that you'd be with us. As we move to the tithes and offerings this morning, Lord, also. We ask that you'd bless this church, Lord God. Lord God, I pray that you would, that you would, uh, you would soften our hearts, Lord God. And whatever it is that you want us to do, Lord, we turn it over to you. Bless this time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. I searched the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise Treasures that fade Never enough You came along And put me back together Every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, no, nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, you still call me friend, cause the God of the mountains, the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Turn mornings 
too dancing You get beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory Turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only. Uh, so we, we're starting off with a new series this morning. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 12, if you have a Bible, so you can turn over there. Um, as you do, there's a number of really exciting things coming up, uh, not just on Wednesday, but next Sunday as well. Uh, we have a, a sort of a big day in our church's history uh, next Sunday. Uh, we are going to be acknowledging uh, the retirement of uh, Doc Anderson as one of the elders of our church. And uh, Doc is a founding elder of our church, him, him and his wife, Ro. The church was actually started in, as a Bible study in their home in the late 70s. And so they've been a huge part of the history of our church. And so they're not going anywhere. Uh, Doc is going to continue as an elder emeritus, but he's, he's retiring from a, an active role on our elder team. And so we want to recognize him for his service and celebrate what God has done through them. So what we're going to do tomorrow, uh, next Sunday after this service is have a little picnic out front of the, the old building uh, like we did at the beginning of the Bible read through. We'll have some burgers and probably cupcakes, stuff like that. Just a chance for us to sort of uh, give Ro a hug and to shake Wendell's hand and to say thank you for all of his years of service. So if you have the ability to stay for after service next Sunday, that'll be right after the service, uh, our retirement picnic for Doc Anderson. And so actually then the next Sunday, and this is just a series of, of big Sundays for us because we're coming up to Easter, right? Uh, and so uh, the, the, the next Sunday, so the 19th, um, that will be the beginning, the launch Sunday for Abide 21. So there'll be the meeting down in the courthouse and all that stuff that we always do. Uh, next week, I'll have sort of a longer announcement about Abide to kind of let you guys know uh, who are maybe newer to our church about what that is all about. That's our 21 days of prayer and fasting initiative that we go on every year with a number of churches in our community. And so uh, be praying how the Lord would have you as an individual or as a family participate in that. Um, what, what would the Lord have you fast from during those 21 days of prayer and fasting as we lead into Easter? Um, the, we, we're excited about that as always. And then uh, on that same Sunday, so two Sundays from now at five o'clock, we're going to have a mission night for my brother, John Russell, who is uh, starting out as a new missionary, as a young 
young man, a soon-to-be newly married uh, man, and uh, he's in the process of raising support and also just wanting to let you, who are his church family, um, know what it is he's going to be doing when he's there in the Philippines. And so um, he was the one who preached last week, if you missed out, or if, you, if you didn't get that connection, the wild, red-headed one. Um, he, he looks like a prophet, and so it's exciting to see what God is going to do in his life. And um, anyway, he, so he'll be talking about what, what, specifically what they're doing there. His work will be with Great Commission Bible Institute Philippines, which is a new work. It's in its first year. Um, my parents got to be a part of establishing that and taking this Bible curriculum that was, that was, uh, that was actually written and developed here in this church over the last 20 years by our former lead pastor, Dr. Andy Smith, as he was developing the curriculum for the school here in Sebring. It's now been franchised out, so to speak. Um, there's a, a location in Canada as well as a location now in the Philippines. And so that teaching and those resources are going out. But the thing I want for y'all to hear and, and the, my call for you to come back on uh, Sunday evening that night is, is this is a, a fruit of y'all's faithfulness, right? Y'all support, y'all's involvement um, over the last 20 years to even make this whole thing possible. And so it's really exciting to see what God's doing uh, with our, our little widow's might, right? To see what he can do with a little bit of obedience and faithfulness. And so, so that's uh, over the next few weeks what you can expect. And uh, we hope to see you at, at, at some or all of those things as we get ready for this Easter season. And as we get prepared for Easter, you know, every year we have to we, we, we ask the same question as your pastors, right? What, what topic or what passage of Scripture do we want to use to talk about Easter and to talk about the cross, to talk about this story, right, that is at the center of human history and it's at the center of our experience and our salvation as Christians with Jesus and the cross and the resurrection? And so what we wanted to do this year is something a little bit different, and that's to actually do talk about passion, which passion is just a church word for the cross and resurrection, right? Let's talk about passion by actually looking at Passover, which both start with P-A-S-S, which is cool. Um, and, and what we see is that the Passover story in Exodus is a foreshadowing of what Jesus was going to do on the cross, that it's like a mirror reflection, that there's, there's a, there's a a series of terms and of, of concepts that get copy and pasted over from one story into the other because sort of like a, a, a book that's a, in, in, books in a series or movies in a series, they're really the same story just played out in different episodes. It's the story of God's work to save his people from slavery to sin. And so in the story of the Exodus, it's a very palpable and real story because God's people are literally enslaved to a literal king, um, but it's no different when we are saved from our slavery to sin. Though it's not a king, there is a kingdom that we are enslaved to, right? A false kingdom that's run by the prince of the power of the air, Paul talks about. So it's the same story repeated and so we're going to look at, over the next few weeks, some of these details, because these details get repeated in both episodes, in both books, so to speak, in both stories. And so this morning what we're going to do is we're going to look at the, this theme of the, of the uh, in, in the Passover story of the firstborn, that the firstborn is a really important idea in the Passover story, and it's the New Testament makes the case that the firstborn thing is still important in the New Testament story, in Jesus' story. And so all of these little details, we've got the firstborn, we've got stuff about the lamb, right? That the lamb is important in the, first, in the, in the Passover story. That blood shed and blood spread on a wooden post is, a, is repeated in both stories, that there is uh, discussion about, um, trying to find my list here, unleavened bread is a big part of both stories. And so these are the examples, right? And each one of these things kind of plays like a piece, like a note in the melody that is the score of our story of redemption, of God's story of salvation. You know, John Williams is the great composer of film scores in our day. He's done everything from the Jaws uh, score all the way through all the Star Wars scores. And the Star Wars movies is probably the greatest example of where a score became the story, right? 
Because if you, I know some of you are like, I didn't realize the pastor was such a nerd, but, <laughs> but if you've watched Star Wars, and you, you probably have, you know that there's a, there's a musical language to Star Wars, that you always know who's on screen based on the music that's playing in the background. And you can anticipate that, that Darth Vader is going to come out behind that door because you've already heard his, his theme song, right? And so these, all these little details in the Passover story sort of play out like that. There are these mu- if it was music, it's these musical motifs, right? That's the musical term for it. That, that when I hear this, I'm supposed to feel this thing. Or it's supposed to remind me of this part from earlier in this piece of music. And it's the same thing happening, but with this epic story, not just a story, but a real life uh, historical story of what God did through his people Israel and what he's doing in the New Testament at the cross. So we're looking this morning doing two things, really. Talking about the first example in the idea of the firstborn and also trying to get a big picture view of the whole story of Passover, um, which is honestly, it takes a minute because the story's long. So we're going to do a lot of Bible reading this morning as well. But So I want to ask a question. This is actually super fascinating in the first service um, to, f- to, f- to get to know you guys a little bit. Um, would you raise your hand if you are a firstborn? Okay, so we've got about the same number. In first, second is first, leave your hands up because we're, we're going to go somewhere with this. Okay, so if you're one of those firstborn in the room, uh, I want you to think about your parents and, and their, their family background. I know some, maybe you don't know, it's possible, but if you know, uh, is one of your, if, if one of your parents is also a firstborn, keep your hand up. So we got about half of us, one of our parents is also firstborn. If both of your parents are also firstborn, keep your hand up. See, that was about what I was expecting to get. I only got one of us in the first service, and there's three of us in the second service. So firstborn of firstborn, that's exciting. You're, we're in a special club all together, I guess. Um, my son is a firstborn. My firstborn son is a firstborn of two firstborn kids, and my parents are also both firstborn, so it goes back a ways for my son, which I don't know what that means, but, um, well, you can, you can actually Google some things. I actually spent some time this week taking a look. There's a lot of, like, uh, there's been a lot of studies been done to look at birth order and its significance. You know, most of us today, we don't really put a lot of stock into all of that, but, but, what it is, but there are some trends. There are some things that people picked up on. In fact, one article that I was reading says that 30%, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, that firstborn um, children are 30% more likely to become a, either a CEO or a politician. So I don't know, that, I guess that means that we're all bossy. Um, but but so, that, so that's an interesting thought, right? Something about being the oldest Something about being the firstborn prepares somebody or puts in pe- some people's minds this idea of leadership. I don't know. Uh, and there's a lot of things that you can learn from that, or maybe you say, hey, that's all just happenstance. But one thing we do know is this. In the Scripture, being a firstborn meant something. It doesn't mean as much today for me. You know, I'm, I'm not going to uh, just by default be the, the one who inherits you know, my family's business. But there was a lot of that that was happening in the ancient world, right? There was a birthright. There was a a special responsibility, a special reverence even, given to firstborns, especially firstborn sons. And so when we read firstborn, we kind of just think, okay, yeah, that's my older brother, or hey, I'm one. Um, I'm one of those. But when we read it in Scripture, our eyes are supposed to kind of uh, let that pop off the page, because in the ancient world, to be a firstborn was very significant. We see this play out in, um, in Exodus chapter 4. This is part of the passage from last week that my brother John um, did such a good job uh, laying out for us. But this is from the end of that chapter. It says, when the, the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, 
I will kill your firstborn son. So we're going to read in a moment the story of the last plague, right? The, the final thing that God did which convinced um, Pharaoh finally to obey, to bow his knee before God and to let the Israelites go free. But the logic that, that God uses, the, the logic that is recorded for us in Exodus as to why this all happened is because Israel belongs to God as a firstborn belongs to a father and to his household in the ancient world. He says, um, they're my, he is my firstborn son, which makes uh, God is to them a, a father. Right? So it's interesting I've, I've, I've read and, um, and, and been, we recently went through a, uh, a series on the Sermon on the Mount and looked specifically at Jesus' prayer that he gives the disciples, right? Depending on what you call it, the Apostles' Prayer, the Disciples' Prayer, um, the Lord's Prayer. And how's it start? It starts, Our Father. And I, I was reading some commentaries and they were talking about how how to the ancient Israelite or to the person, the Jew in Jesus' day, the idea that God was a father would have been, uh, would have been surprising. See, because God was primarily seen as this, uh, the, the, mysterious, the mysterious cloud that was at the top of the mountain that Moses went up to see, right? That, that, that God, in the, in, the, in the Jewish mindset, that God was, was holy and set apart and the Almighty and all of these big terms that are related to reverence, right? And that God, or, or rather Jesus, chose to teach us as his disciples to call God Father is somehow a new idea in the New Testament. But here's what we see right in front of us. It's not a new idea, is it? God, God, in his introduction to the Israelites after 400 years in slavery, what he says is, you're my firstborn son. What does that mean? Some of you have a firstborn son, right? So you can, you can, at, least, you can, you can at least apply a little bit of your own personal experience to know that to call somebody your son, right, is, is an incredible privilege, and it's an incredible responsibility. And, and with, the, with the title of father comes all these things, right, that I'm your defender, that I'm your provider, that I'm your, your guide and your teacher in life. Like, this is what fatherhood is supposed to mean. So God comes in and he says, I'm not just their God, I'm their father. That's something for us to pause and, rec and recognize, right? And this is so, what, so the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is, no, is, is not changed when Jesus steps, steps into the scene and says, talk to God and say, our Father, who is in heaven, holy is your name. That's the first firstborn in the story. Who's the second firstborn son in this right here? You got the firstborn of Who? Of, no, well, we got Israel is my firstborn, and I say to you, to, to, that is to Pharaoh, let my son go, that he, can serve, that he would serve me. And if you refuse to let him go, I will kill your firstborn son. Talking to Pharaoh, so he's talking about Pharaoh's firstborn. Egypt was a place, and it was true for much of the ancient world, but especially in Egypt, Egypt was a place that put incredible value, worth, and reverence on firstborn sons. Pharaoh is described as a firstborn of firstborn. And it was all a part of this birthright system. Uh, one author that I was reading this week says, um, says that the firstborn um, had a birthright from which he exercised power. And so the attack, God's... Uh, Attack against the firstborn was a powerful statement against the entire culture of Egypt. That it was something very specific going on that God was trying to communicate. God was specifically targeting the firstborn power structure because it was part of this 
divine right of kings understanding that they had. And he wanted to come in and say, there's actually only one king, and it's me. So for us, the, the horror of the death of any child, right, is enough to make God's judgment seem pretty heavy, right? Like that's, that's something that makes us uncomfortable, and I think it's supposed to make you uncomfortable, as we're going to talk about in a minute. But for Pharaoh, specifically the death of not just any son, and if you're not firstborn, don't hear me saying that you're less, but I'm talking about their culture, right? It wasn't just any son. It was for Pharaoh, his firstborn son. The firstborn son was irreplaceable. You can't have another firstborn son. And, and, and so there is this weight to, what God, to this message from God. This was supposed to be a wake-up call message from God. And it didn't land on soft ears. In fact, what God is saying is actually Pharaoh has a hard heart. I'm going to lean into the hardness of Pharaoh's heart. I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart even. So with all that being said, I, w- I, wanted, I wanted to kind of paint that picture because, like I said, for us, firstborns, like, it's, it doesn't really mean anything. I didn't, I didn't choose to be the firstborn son, right? I didn't do anything to deserve being the firstborn. I just happened, right? Just like all of us. And so in our culture, it's not really a big deal. But for them, firstborn son is a high, high value. Which, which, if we don't understand that, we won't be able to fully understand and comprehend the story we're about to read in Exodus, Exodus chapter 12. Here it is. It's Exodus chapter 12. And so we're going to read a big section of this, of this uh, chapter right here. Uh, let's start in verse 1. It says, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. If the household is too small for a lamb, then he he and his nearest neighbors shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat. You shall make account for the lamb. You shall, uh, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night. Roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted its head and its legs and its inner parts. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. This shall, in this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand." And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. We're going to skip down to verse 21. What we've been reading at this point is the instructions. And so what we're about to read in verse 21 is what happened. So if it sounds repetitive, it's because it is. But it's repetitive for a reason. They actually did what God told them to do. Now, That's not a given in the Old Testament, is it? Usually, we get an instruction from God, and then we read about how they sort of did it, right? But in this particular story, the point that the author is trying to make, like through the Holy Spirit, is trying to help us to see God gave very specific instructions through Moses and Aaron, and 
by the power of the Holy Spirit, <laughs> apparently, God's people actually listened. And so we see that happen in verse 21. And we're skipping verse 14 through 19 because it's, it it's going to talk about how they're to continue the celebration later, okay? To practice it every year. Verse 21 picks up. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You shall observe this rite as a statute for you and your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, for he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshiped. Then the people of Israel went and did so, as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. At midnight, the Lord struck down all of the firstborn of the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who is in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all of his servants and all of the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. Then he summoned Moses and Aaron by night and said, Up. Go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go. Serve the Lord, as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds, as you have said, and go. Be gone, and bless me also. The Egyptians were urgent with the people of Israel to send them out of the land in haste, for they said, We shall all be dead. So that's the story, and as we can tell, there's a lot of details, right? And we're going to spend the next few weeks going over those details. But it's important that we get a picture of the whole story before we do that. So that's why we read so much this morning. What I want for us to see from this passage as we, as we go back and continue to reflect on this idea of the firstborn and, and why did God do what he did is two things. I just want to, I want to talk about two things. The first is this. Sin costs you everything. Sin, rebellion against God, which is what Pharaoh was doing, right, costs you everything. Um, the value of the firstborn for Pharaoh, as we said, was intrinsic, and it was Without replacement, there was nothing you could do, he could do to replace that firstborn son that was lost. It's also significant, right? Pharaoh was, was more than likely, if not positively, also a firstborn. He was the only one to survive. I don't know if that's grace or if that's judgment, right? To know that you were the only one that because of your decision, all of these others are dead, but you are there still alive standing. I don't know. There's something to that, I think. But sin costs you everything. You know, it, we, can, we can, some of us don't have to think hard about this, right? We know what it's like to have lost a child and the permanent scars that that leaves, right? And so there is this there's this somber and serious tone to this story for sure. And the reason is that it goes all the way back to the beginning. And it's one of the most important establishing truths of the faith, which is that sin leads to death, right? Is what Paul taught in Romans. Um, what Paul taught in Romans, can you pull up that Romans passage? Uh, forever. Uh, for when you were slaves to sin, you were free in regard to righteousness, but what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? That's a great line, right? He says, that you, we used to be freed from serving God, but we were serving sin. How was that working out for y'all, he says? 
Was that a fun time? <laughs> what fruit did that bear? He says, nothing but hardship, nothing but sadness, right? For the end of all these things, that is service to sin, is what? Death. But now you have been set free from sin and have been become slaves of God. The fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Someone always dies for sin. Sin always leads to death. In a mathematical formula, sin equals death. And and this is the the biblical understanding. This is a biblical worldview. This is all across the Bible. In fact, if you go back to the beginning in Genesis um, Genesis chapter 2, verse 15... It says that the Lord took the man and put him in the middle of the garden to work it and keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, You shall surely eat of every tree of the garden, but the tree of knowledge and of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So the message of Genesis and the message of Paul in Romans is the same. Sin equals death. What's interesting is this. Did Adam and Eve die when they ate? Well, there's a couple different answers to the question, right? So did they die physically? No. No, they're, they, their conscience, they, suddenly, suddenly they become aware, right, of their sin, and they, and they hide, and they put on fig leaves, and, and the, the consequences of that are clear, but they did not physically die. Right. But Paul would argue in Ephesians that they did die spiritually, right? That apart from our new life in Christ, we are all spiritually dead. That every person that does not proclaim Jesus as their Lord and Savior is basically a zombie. They are the walking dead from a theological and a spiritual standpoint. But it's interesting, right? God would have been totally justified in the moment of Eve consuming that fruit to snuff out her life the same way he snuffed out the lives of the firstborn in Egypt, right? And, the, and, and the, the message of the scriptures and the message of the gospel, and it doesn't sound like good news until you hear the other side of it, but the message of the gospel is we all deserve to be snuffed out at the moment that we, that we sin. The moment that we rebel against a holy God, we deserve to die in that moment, both, both physically and spiritually, right? That helps us to get around to the point of the death of the firstborn. What is going on? Is God just out to prove a point and so he kills a bunch of people's kids? That's, that's, that's one way to read it, right? Is God exacting revenge? See, because remember a couple of chapters earlier, who was the ones killing Israelite sons? It was Pharaoh, it was the Egyptians. It was Pharaoh's idea to have all those babies killed. So are, is, this, is this a judgment and a revenge on that? I think it's connected, but I don't think that's the message. I think the message is this. Sin will always cost you everything. Sin always leads to death. And every breath that you breathe is a proof that there is a loving God in heaven who is showing you grace. Every heartbeat that we experience in our chest, which, as my brother eloquently reminded us last week, we don't control, right? We can control when we breathe, but I can't control, I can't make my heart beat again. Only by God's grace. Do I even stand here? Do any of us exist? Because we all deserve to die for our sin. And by the way, I think the, the Egyptians actually got the theological teaching at the end. Did you notice what they said? What did the Egyptians say as the Israelites were running out of town? We got to get these guys out of here because if they don't leave, we're all going to die. They understood what it was. They understood the wages of sin is death in a way that, uh, that we probably don't always understand. See, because we believe the lie that the serpent was selling Eve before she sinned, which was, but is it really that big of a deal? 
did God really say? And what, he, well, and what the enemy does is twist truth and says, sin isn't actually going to cost you everything. It's just going to cost you a little bit. And we, can, and we can do a little bit of like, we can do a little bit of risk management and we can manage sin, keep a little sin and have God on the side and it'll really be okay. And what the message of the Exodus story is, now that's not how it works. We, and we all deserve, right? And until we understand that not just those firstborn deserved what they got, that sounds hard, Right? Not only did those firstborn deserve death, but Moses deserved death. That the Israelites deserved death. That all of the other Egyptians that didn't die deserved death because sin will always cost you everything. And the fact that any of us are here is a sign that God's doing something. That God has you here for a purpose because He would be totally just in having you, any of us killed for our sin. But that's not the end of the story, is it? Because God paid the debt with his everything. Sin always costs us everything. But God has paid our debt with his everything. The substitution of the firstborn for the whole nation of Egypt is a, for, a formula and a pattern. The firstborn died to set free the Israelites. So God's firstborn died to set free the whole world. In Genesis uh, verse 20, uh, chapter 22, we have the famous story of where um, Abraham and Isaac go up the mountain because God has told I, Abraham to kill Isaac. And it's a, it's a story that if you read it on its own, it will drive you crazy. Because what on earth was God doing? It makes no sense. Why would God put Abraham through that kind of psychological torment? Not to mention poor Isaac. But what was happening in that story? God was establishing a pattern just like he was doing in the Exodus. Because in the middle of that story, right before Abraham goes through with it, and we're like, that guy was psycho. Right? You can call it faith, or you can call it sick in the head. I don't know what you're, where you want to go. It might be a little irreverent, but let's just be honest. That's what, we've, what we're all thinking. And God intervenes, right? What does he say? He says, Abraham, Abraham... And he said, here I am. He's, and then God said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your, your son, your only son, from me. Every time you see repetition in the Old Testament, it's for a reason. The point you're supposed to take away is your son, your only son. So then thousands of years later, Jesus, God incarnate, is sitting across having a late night theology talk with a, with a new friend of his. Have you ever had one of those? It's always better to talk theology late at night. But he's talking to a guy named Nicodemus, right? And Nicodemus is super confused and doesn't understand what Jesus is preaching. So he takes him aside and asks him some questions. And in the middle of that, Jesus gives probably the most important verse in the New Testament, or the one that most people have memorized, right? And what does he say? He says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in the, in the order that the world might be saved through him. It's fascinating. I was thinking about this this week. This verse says nothing about the cross, right? Not explicitly. It doesn't say anything about a sacrifice, but what it does do is talking to Nicodemus, this guy who was steeped in the Old Testament, he uses the language from the Abraham and Isaac story. And he says, I, I led Abraham up, up a mountain to have him sacrifice his only son. I didn't let him go through with it. But guess what I'm here to do? I'm here to be pierced when Isaac never was, right? I'm here to go through with what I never asked Abraham to do because only I could take on the sin of the world. Only I, Jesus, 
could be the Passover lamb. And so what we have here is a reminder, right? This scene, this moment of what Jesus is teaching. When we apply that only son, and it's not the same language as firstborn, but it's similar language, isn't it? It's, it's implied, if you're the only son, you are also the firstborn son. That Jesus is the firstborn. That's a big point in the, new, in the rest of the New Testament. And it sounds weird, right? It sounds like, why? How could Jesus be firstborn? We thought, I thought Jesus existed forever with the, you know, with the Father and the Holy Spirit, and that's true. But the point of the, him being the firstborn is not that he came into existence when he gave, came through Mary. It's that he is the firstborn from the Exodus story. That, he, that, that both God and Pharaoh lose their firstborn. Right? Pharaoh lost his firstborn through, through putting his, you know, stomping his feet and, and raising his fist to God. And in defiance, God takes his firstborn. God freely gives, right? According to his own will and according to Jesus' will. His firstborn to save many. And so the New Testament authors, three of them as we'll see here, um, use this same language. It says, For the, those whom he foreknew, he also predestined uh, to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he, that is Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brothers. He, I, I'm starting a family. He's just the firstborn, he says. Uh, and then in Colossians, that's a fam- another famous one. It says, He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Those are both from Paul. And then uh, in Hebrews 1, 6, it says, again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. We don't know who wrote Hebrews. There's lots of theories. So that's two different New Testament writers. And then finally, John, the disciple that Jesus loved in Revelation verses one, uh, chapter 1, verse 5, says, from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. So there's a thing here, Right? So when we read about the firstborn in the Exodus story, there's supposed to be this theme music playing. We're supposed to understand that God is up to something here. What is he up to? And what is the point of the message? Well, remember, what, what is a firstborn? Incredibly valuable, right? In of inestimable of inestimable worth. And if God was willing to give up the only begotten firstborn son for you and for me, what does that say about him? And perhaps for us on a day-to-day basis, even more importantly, what does that mean about you? Because I don't know about the voices in your head. And some of you are like, oh wait, our pastor has voices in his head. That's probably bad news. But I don't, I don't know about your inner dialogue, but mine is often full of accusations and of these messages that I am useless or worthless <laughs> or don't have any value. And what we have to recognize is when we believe that, when we live from that, we are walking defeated already. And I don't think, that we'll, I don't think we ever get to a place where we don't struggle with those thoughts and th- struggle with those feelings. But the thing we have in the Scriptures is a clear-cut statement that is not just a story, not just a cute poem. It's human history was written to communicate to us I value you enough. I was willing to give up the only son for you. So don't sit around thinking that you're worthless. Don't sit around with the identity of a sinner. You're a saint. You're a blood-bought son or daughter of the king. That's who you are. Value is always determined by the price somebody's willing to pay. And it's subjective, right? Right? What you'll spend money on, I might not think is valuable. What I spend money on, somebody might look and say, I would never invest in that. I don't don't care about that, right? We spend and we sacrifice our time and our treasure for stuff that we see as valuable. What did God spend 
on? Where did he invest? And that tells us something about who we are that we have to be able to grasp from this story. How deep the Father's love, how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. I've said it before, and I'll continue to say it. I don't think I'd give up my son for anybody, right? But yet God did that for me. And so put away the lies and believe the truth about who you are in Christ. I'll close with one more verse in this. The love of God is made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might believe through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son to be the covering for our sins. Would you pray, for, would you pray with me? Lord, there's nothing we can do this morning but say thank you. And that we love you and that you are worthy of our, our praise. You are worthy of all things. And Lord, I, I pray that you would put these truths, that you would write them on our hearts so that when we're in these moments where we're being deceived, where we believe the lies, that we would stop and that we would hear your voice instead of, instead of the lies. Would you keep us in your, under your wings? Would you protect us? And would you provide for us as a father does? And you are so, so good to us. You're such a good shepherd. And we have nothing that we need because we have you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When darkness tries to roll over my bones, when sorrow comes to seal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know No, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your life to the light I'm not afraid to leave my past behind No, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love Break off every chain. There's power that can empty out a grave. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name. Power in your name. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out the grave. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name.
So this morning, Lord, thank you for the reminder, Lord, this morning. Lord, this week, I pray that you would guide us, Lord, once again. Take our hearts, Lord God. We put them in your hands, Lord God, because we know you're faithful. So this week, Lord God, bring us back safely. Lord God, help us take this message out this morning, this week. And bring it back safely. Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so before you go, all right, so before you go, we've got the video, we think. It's only 50 seconds, so you don't even have to sit down. It's only 50 seconds. Hello, my name is Joel Smith. I'm the president of Young Americans for Freedom at Sebring High School. On March 8th, which will be Wednesday, we will be hosting Kristen Hawkins, who is the president of Students for Life here at Sebring High School, located in the Smith Center at 6.30. Hi, I'm Vivian Coughlin, and I'm here to tell you about Kristen Hawkins, who happens to be the president of the National Organization for Students for Life, whose goal is to reach kids like me, our generation, who is the biggest target for the pro-abortion industry. Hi, my name is Taylor Levitt, and I'm here to personally invite you to our event featuring Kristen Hawkins. I'd love to see you there. So yeah, a little invitation for you. If you've got any questions about any of that, uh, our very own Virgil Beato would love to answer them. Um, so yeah, thanks for coming, everybody.